My name is, uh, let's see, my name is Danica. Uh, I'm a hacktivist and a software developer. Uh, I come from an activist background, but I now work on uh, Deflect, it's a DDoS mitigation service. So I'm going to let uh, Floriana introduce herself. Hello, I'm Floriana, and uh, I used to work for the same DDoS mitigation system. Now I help users at risk in uh, Access Now's helpline. Uh, and, uh, the reason why I started to become a hacktivist and to work with protecting users at risk is uh, that uh, once upon a time I was uh, um, doing uh, something that was, could have been called activism and then I found out about activism online and uh, joined it very eagerly. So it all uh, uh, happened with a friend uh, um, talking to me on the phone and giving me instructions on how to join an IRC channel, a chat. And uh, from there I got instructions on how to participate in a thing that was called net strike. Um, this net strike was a uh, um, virtual demonstration, as they used to call it at the time. And uh, nobody had ever done it before. It was organized uh, for the first time by an Italian group which was called Strano Network, Strange Network, translated literally. And uh, they organized it for the first time for uh, these um, nuclear experiments. That's what France was uh, doing on uh, the Mururoa Atoll. And um, actually, it didn't work that well because even if uh, they were trying uh, to take down websites um, that were not really secured or and were a bit primitive, I'm talking about 1995, they were still trying to take down uh, websites of the French government. And they were still like 100 activists, so it didn't work that well. But uh, it started to work well uh, the year, af uh, year afterwards, uh, in May 1996, when there was another net strike organized not only by the Italians, but at this point by a network of international groups. And uh, they attacked the, net the website of the White House uh, to protest against uh, the, um, to protest for the liberation and in support of two political prisoners, Mumia Abu Jamal and Silvia Barardini, who had been uh, members or supporters of the Black Liberation Army. Uh, at this point, there was a thousand uh, activists around and uh, they attacked the White House and the White House went down. It went down, the, the website went down for an hour and um, from uh, 18 to 19 p.m. GMT plus one. And um, what happened was simply that these thousand activists were reloading uh, the page of the White House uh, manually, like playing, clicking reload, 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 and uh, the White House website went down. So this became something. Uh, it became a practice uh, in the activist movements of the time. And uh, it was connected to the support to the Zapatista movement in Chiapas. It was uh, connected to many other protests against wars. And uh, uh, the anti-globalization movement st started to embrace this technique and to use it aside their uh, physical technique of techniques of demonstrations and so on. Um, so, up to now, up to 1998, all these protests uh, online had been done really manually, like people clicking on reload on the page. But then, uh, in 1998, something interesting happened. Uh, another uh, group that was organizing these virtual sit-ins, that was called uh, Electri Electronic Disturbance Theater from the United States, developed this applet that was called Floodnet, and uh, people could just open the page with the Flatnet Apple uh, applet and uh, click or uh, choose the website they wanted to DDoS and click on the send message. At this point, their browser was automatically sending uh, reload uh, requests uh, to a single page. But what happened also, and uh, here the story starts to become 
more complicated and more um, connected to power reactions was that we saw the first time when uh, states started to react to online protests uh, with the same tools that had been used for the protests. Uh, and while the protests were uh, already challenged as being illegal, uh, at the same time uh, the Pentagon stru stru struck against uh, uh, virtual sit-in uh, with another applet that was recognizing this applet in the browsers of users and make them crash. So it was challenged at the time that the Pentagon was using uh, cyber weapons against cyber weapons uh, and uh, actually um, <coughs> it wasn't really something new that a state or the authorities were fighting back with weapons against protests. Uh, and this was only the beginning. We will see during this talk that it went on and it became a bit more difficult and more uh, cyber weaponish, as Donica will uh, tell us. But anyway, despite the Pentagon striking back, um, it became, the um, virtual settings became so widespread that they became one of the main two techniques used by the alter globalization movement straddling the millennium. And um, it be this technique became particularly uh, used uh, also when the physical protests weren't possible anymore. Because they had, these physical protests had become a bit more ex too expensive and challenging for authorities. And they started to be moved to places where they were not possible, like Doha in Qatar uh, at the end of 2001. And at the end of 2001, there was this uh, protest against the WTO meeting that was only possible online. So it was going on online. At the same time, protests uh, get cracked down on, and this happened also with the net strike. Uh, in August 2001, just after the meeting uh, of uh, the G8 in Genoa, um, the net strike server was seized and uh, activists of NetStrike were arrested and got very long protests, uh, processes and uh, really overwhelming accusers uh, for crimes that had only been like taking down a website for a couple of hours. Uh, so that's why we stopped doing, using this kind of technique uh, but then, after uh, five years or so, we saw other, another generation starting again with these techniques. And these techniques became much more media, attracted much more media attention and became much more widespread. And this is what Donica is going to talk about. Thanks, so, uh, unlike uh, Flo, who had her first experiences with um, more offline activism and then moved into uh, digital activism, uh, I had my first experience with activism uh, online. Uh, growing up on a farm in rural Ireland, I didn't really have much demonstrations to go to. But having uh, like friends and people I would talk to online, it seemed obvious that the internet would also be a place where you could organize and demonstrate and protest the things that you didn't think were right in the world. So my first um, exposure, I guess, to Anonymous, the Anonymous Collective, was in uh, 20, 2010. So these uh, next generation of digital activists had a new tool, and it was quite similar to uh, FloodNet in its function, but uh, the, kinda, the graphics were more fancy and it had uh, some key new features. Uh, one of the main features that um, LOIC, the Low Orbit Ion Cannon, had that uh, the FloodNet tool didn't is it had a so-called uh, hive mind uh, mode. So with the hive mind mode, uh, activists didn't have to be sitting at their computer and waiting for the appointed time uh, to start launching the attack. They can instead um, kind of delegate their control of their computer, of their resources, to uh, some other members of the group. So you can kind of delegate uh, the timing of the target of the attack to uh, an IRC chat room. So once people decide that, okay, now's the time and this is the target we're going to attack, your computer will start uh, making requests. So you can be in school, you can be asleep, you can be at work, and yet your computer can still be uh, participating in this uh, demonstration. Uh, so this uh, LOIC tool really came to prominence in uh, late 2010, and it was much more popular um, and widespread than uh, the previous tools. I think it had about um, half a million downloads uh, by uh, late 2010. So it was uh, quite, a, quite a popular tool. Uh, a major case where uh, uh, action where LOIC was used 
was in December 2010 when uh, uh, multiple financial companies started in instituting a financial uh, blockade on donations to WikiLeaks. So it started off with some banks and uh, later PayPal got involved when they froze donations to a German foundation, the Valhallen Stiftung, which was accepting donations for WikiLeaks. So after these donations were frozen, uh, anonymous activists got uh, frustrated by uh, the attempts to st prevent uh, WikiLeaks from publishing by cutting off their, uh, their funding sources. So the activists uh, started launching attacks uh, first against the main PayPal website, and after the attacks against the main PayPal website didn't go anywhere, didn't succeed, people instead uh, directed their, uh, their log tool to target the PayPal blog, uh, and the PayPal blog went down for a few hours. So the PayPal blog is definitely, um, so this is a, part of after a continuation of Operation Payback. So while the PayPal blog uh, went down, and this is kind of a, a figurehead for the company, it's not exactly their critical infrastructure. It's not exactly stopping all their payments and causing them major, uh, major financial harm. The main, the main repercussion is that uh, media attention and public awareness is being drawn towards PayPal's uh, role uh, in this, um, in stopping these payments. Of course, like, uh, like Flo described earlier, uh, shortly after there was, there was a law enforcement response, and uh, in uh, February 2011, uh, the FBI across the US conducted a house raids, and they arrested uh, 14 uh, men and women, uh, mostly young, young people, for their participation in this attack. Um, through a long process over a space of a few years, they, all the def people got uh, originally charged with uh, two uh, federal uh, crimes. Uh, unfortunately, uh, during the process, these were lowered to a misdemeanor, and they had to pay a combined restitution of $80,000. As you can imagine, it's uh, a pretty traumatic experience having to go through this uh, court process uh, for a couple of years for uh, a digital protest where uh, they were just participating with their own uh, individual computers. <clears throat> so this uh, law enforcement response didn't just stop with the, the legal system. Uh, Intelligence agencies also got involved trying to uh, stop uh, this type of online uh, dissent. One major uh, attack that we only know about of because of the documents released by Edward Snowden is actions by a secret uh, GCHQ uh, uh, department. So this department is called uh, JTRIG, and they're involved in uh, disrupting groups online with uh, propaganda or sock puppets or by doing online attacks. So what happened here was these GCHQ agents saw that there was lots of uh, activists coordinating on an IRC channel, uh, a big chat room, and they launched their own denial of service attack against these uh, activists who were discussing, and they knocked the servers offline, so they stopped all of these people uh, communicating um, for a number of days, and eventually people left as the service uh, wasn't working. So it's, uh, it gets very uh, tricky, and it gets very... Um, I guess morally dubious when you have uh, a state and using its power and using the same techniques without any uh, like judicial basis to go and attack activists. And while there was maybe you know, dozens of people on these channels who were committing uh, illegal actions, the vast mass majority, thousands of people, were just uh, talking, were just uh, raising issues, creating media, uh, other campaigning that was completely legal. And it's a very broad tool when you start using these kinds of digital attacks to silence and prevent these people from communicating. <clears throat> when it's, um, yeah, it's when these attacks are used uh, by activists to raise awareness, it's a, a power leveler, but when they're used by states, it becomes much more tricky. <clears throat> one thing that changed after, uh, one thing that changed after 2011 is that a lot more uh, sites uh, started getting protection, so it wasn't as easy to uh, take websites down. So this also changed how these attacks happened, how these actions happened. It was no longer possible for individuals with their own desktop computers to really m make any effect. Instead, most of the major actions happened with people with uh, using something called botnets. So these are people using compromised computers to try and uh, overload the website. So this is much less a participatory thing and much less uh, the criminal use of computers to attack someone. And it's normally controlled by one or a small group of people, so it's much less a uh, participatory event. And this, this type of attack with lots of different computers that are controlled by one group is a DDoS attack, a distributed denial of service attack, using a botnet. 
So often we've seen uh, these attacks uh, beginning, uh, continue to be used in coordination with uh, physical, uh, physical warfare, traditional warfare. Uh, so during the Russia-Georgia war in 2008, uh, at the same time uh, Russia, Russian tanks were invading Georgia, there was lots of uh, DDoS attacks happening against uh, Georgian political websites, against different ministries, against uh, the media organizations. Uh, at, before the Georgian government had good DDoS mitigation services, they even resorted to uh, putting the Ministry of Foreign Affairs website temporarily on Google's Blogspot service, because Google could uh, keep their service online, whereas their own services couldn't stay online. It's, not very, it's, it's very unclear whether any of these actions are in fact being done by states or if it's just uh, patriotic hackers who see their own country you know, getting in a confrontation and want to show off that you know, they can help out and do their part by launching some DDoS attacks. Most of the attacks ha are targeting media organizations and kind of government figurehead websites which are kind of a symbol but they're not really damaging the infrastructure of the state in, in most cases. <coughs> We've seen these attacks continue in Ukraine, and this is uh, something we've seen in our work with Deflect and how these, uh, how these attacks uh, continue and develop. Yeah, what we've seen uh, is that states start, states' authorities um, have started to use these attacks more often than activists. Activists have sort of left that technique because you need a lot of resources uh, but what we see is that the a counter mm, tendency to that. And uh, this is uh, one of the things we've seen with Deflect. Uh, Deflect, as we said, um, is a website protection uh, service uh, that protects websites against DDoS attacks. And it does it like with this network of servers you can see here in the middle. They're called edges. And they respond to every visit by external visitors to websites uh, by serving the resources, the web pages that have been asked for by, the, by your browser or by bots or by um, any, any kind of requests are uh, answered by this network of uh, edge servers while the real web server that hosts a website uh, is hidden behind the network. So when you go and uh, visit a website that is protected by Deflect, you will never visit actually, your browser will not send a request to, your, to the web server that is hosting the website, but will send uh, your request to the network in between that will then serve the resources uh, to you. And the same network, if it receives a request from a botnet, will uh, try to recognize the bots and eventually ban them. Um, so, uh, by doing this work, Deflect can gather a lot of data on botnets and on bots and analyze the attacks, uh, which is what it does with a project called Deflect Labs, uh, which is exactly the tool we are using, Deflect is using to analyze attacks. Uh, and one of the attacks in Ukraine we saw uh, in uh, 2016, after the attacks due to the war, uh, was uh, an attack against uh, an independent media website that was fighting corruptions in northern Ukraine, and uh, it was fighting against the privatization of a nearby forest. Uh, the website is called Kotsubinska. And as you can see in this graph, um, during um, these attacks, uh, the website was getting more, the website is written in Ukrainian, and it was getting a lot of visits from Vietnam, Brazil, Korea. Uh, that's exactly what, when you can say uh, that something is, not, is wrong. Uh, because they don't happen to speak Ukrainian in Vietnam normally. Um, so this connection would have completely uh, taken down the website uh, had it not been protected by Deflect. Uh, but what it showed was that the corrupt people were trying to silence uh, the, um, the website. And so uh, it stayed online, and eventually even the corrupt major wasn't elected uh, after some months at the next elections. Um, another uh, state attack, or 
possibly because we cannot really do attribution in this kind of analysis. We can only understand what can be the motives behind an attack. Uh, was uh, on uh, uh, attacks going on between February and March last year against the boycott, divestment and sanction movement, BDS movement, which is uh, an international campaign to pressure Israel to comply with international law. And um, this attack, the, the analysis showed that there had been several techniques employed and uh, very strong botnets employed and uh, the BDS movement after uh, the report was published declared that these attacks might as well, might possibly come from Israel itself which had um, threatened the BDS movement to boycott it. Another attack we've seen that has not, is not connected to states but is anyway connected to privilege is uh, an attack con connected to the campaign All uh, Op All Lives Matter against Black Lives Matter. They attacked uh, the Black Lives Matter official website uh, and have been attacking it even after the report was published and that's why the Black Lives Matter website went, was protected by deflect. Um, uh, the attacks went on and uh, it, they had been, in the beginning they were uh, launched uh, publicly on Twitter by a crew called Ghost ha uh, Hacker Squad, uh, but uh, then uh, as you can see from an analysis which you can find at this URL which I wrote down there, um, there were several techniques involved, so there must have been a crowd of people participating in the attack independently from Ghost Squad hackers. Uh, at the same time, also botnets were employed. And the fact that these botnets were employed by a crew of uh, young kids in the end uh, shows how uh, DDoS is becoming uh, a tool used for silencing protests uh, and for censoring opposition. And it's cheaper and cheaper to rent a botnet to launch a DDoS attack. So, uh, as much so that uh, Brian Krebs last year, uh, at the end of the year, was uh, talking about the democratization of censorship. Who is Brian Krebs? Brian Krebs is a, a, a digital security journalist who runs a website called Krebs on Security. And he was attacked in September last year by one of the, by the strongest attack that had ever been seen um, historically, it, w it reached a peak of 620 gigabytes per second, and it, uh, the Akamai, which was the company hosting this website, wasn't able to protect it and had to, to pull out the plug. And uh, the website was uh, offline for four days before Google Project Shield, which is another DDoS mitigation system for civil society, uh, like Deflect, uh, took it on. After one week, this thing came out. Uh, it was the public release of the malware that had been used for attacking Brian Krebs. Uh, and um, it's called Mirai. And uh, it's a malware that can be used to infect Internet of Things devices, which means that cameras, uh, fridges, and any other Internet of Things device can be infected to launch DDoS attacks. And it was used again a month after that in the biggest DDoS we've ever seen so far. It reached 1.2 terabits per second, which is double as much as uh, Krebs on security website attack. And uh, it uh, was directed against the DNS server DIN and took offline important services, web services like Twitter or Amazon or stuff like that for several hours for America, for the US and for parts of Europe. Uh, so at this point we are where we don't, DDoS is not a pro uh, protest technique anymore. It's being used to silence and to censor and what we can hope for is that IoT devices uh, get more secured by their producers but because at the moment it, there is no possibility of protecting them against this kind of malware. And uh, in be, in the same, at the same time, DDoS mitigators like Deflect or Google Pro Project Shield and uh, Google Shield Project or other um, 
civil society organizations and digital security organizations are trying to share their resources uh, to increase the protection against this kind of attacks. So if you're interested in uh, protecting your website or in uh, sharing resources, uh, talk to us or contact deflect.ca and we can talk more. Uh, we wanted to give some time for questions, so our talk is finished and we are ready. To... Um, thank you. There's time for one question, if there's someone here. Hi, uh, thank you for your talk. My name is uh, Ernst. Um, I have a question, the, 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 the flex service that you're offering, uh, how do you decide who to protect? Or is it open for all? It's uh, open for uh, the civil society and for uh, independent media uh, and um, they, the users of Deflect must uh, uh, respect the Declaration of Human Rights. And it's a non-for-profit free service. Any other questions? Maybe how, how, can, how can we um, support these deflects um, or these shields against DDoS attacks? How is it possible to... Because you are working on, on, on these projects, right? Uh, so I guess for other companies that are doing DDoS mitigation service, I think we get some kind of immunity if we share uh, information about attacks and we can correlate them and we can try and uh, identify some of the people and groups who are running these. I think as a civil society we can have a better chance of defending against them. So all information sharing uh, to defend against this is, um, is great and I think that's uh, very important. Afterwards. All right. Let's wrap it up then. Thank you. Thank you.